Hey Chess Kids, Fun Master Mike is back with another openings lesson. This one is on the very strange Ponzi Annie opening. Is it a Ponzi scheme? Well, we're going to find out. But before we get into it, hit the subscribe button so you can learn about a lot more openings. Now, in this position as white, white usually plays either the Italian game, bishop c4, maybe the move knight c3. Fun Master Mike often plays the scotch, which is d4. However, what about this really weird hmm. move c3? Well, this is the start of the Ponziani, and I'm not really going to be recommending it for white, which is why we're looking at it from the black perspective in case somebody plays it against you. Now, the point of this move is to defend the center, so if white ever plays the move d4 and black takes, white can take back with the pawn and white would get the snow plow. So it obviously makes sense from that perspective, but it takes away your knight's happy square, and that could be a problem because now this pawn cannot be defended by its natural helper. So, if this knight cannot come to c3 to defend this pawn, the most common response by black is just to play knight f6. And if you're a safe, solid player, this would be my recommendation. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. You might not get an advantage, but as black, if you get an equal position after move three, that's pretty good. And here's how black might continue. White might try the move d4. And then if you take this pawn, which is a good move, white needs to get the pawn back. And white usually plays d5 to distract your knight. And when your knight goes back to e7, white recovers the pawn. And because this knight is getting in the way of your development, you can just play a move knight to g6. There are no problems on the e file. Don't worry about that. And the game is about equal. For example, if the knight takes, you would take back toward the center. And remember, you don't have to worry about this move because you can defend your knight by breaking the pin and the game is considered about equal. In fact, I might even prefer black because black's rook is in the game and this pawn actually looks a little bit exposed, looks a little bit weak. So if I had to choose, I'd probably choose black. So once again, that is the safest continuation. Now, if you're a pretty crazy player after d5, you could try to learn this move bishop c5. However, you are sacrificing a piece and on Honestly, how often are you going to get in this position? I'm not a big fan of studying deep gambits that you may never get into in your entire life. But technically, this move is playable because if the knight gets captured, you can take here. Oh. And black is supposed to have compensation for the piece, although it's a little bit weird. Okay, let's go back. If you are an attacking player, I actually have an even different option for you that I think you'll like more. So, once again, after c3, knight f6, most solid move. But... F5 is a counter gambit, as we say. Black says, no, I will be sacrificing the pawn. And, yep, yeah, yeah, put it down. This is one of the times you have Fun Master Mike's written permission, or at least digital permission, to move your F pawn. And today what we're going to do is we're actually going to follow a game where Hikaru Nakamura got beat in the U.S. Championship. Now, he was much younger than he is today. At the current time of me recording this video, he's number two in the world, so we're not picking on him. But I do want to show you the power of F5 Black was Julio Becerra Rivero, personal friend of mine. And the game continued with Nakamura playing the move D4. Then Julio oh. captured... Nakamura got the pawn back, and there's a big problem. Queen to h5. Whenever you move your f pawn, you have to watch out for this check. So Julio made sure that the queen did not come down to the schoolyard. By the way, if you're over the age of 45, you understand that joke. Knight f6 stops the queen from coming to h5. So Hikaru played bishop to b5, and now Julio wants to clarify the positioning of this knight. You don't want to really take, because when white takes back, your knight's in danger and really doesn't have anywhere good to go. So. Julio played bishop d6, basically forcing this knight to decide what it wants to do. The knight ran away, and then the bishop ran away, so we didn't get the doubled pawns. Then the bishop came back to the square a4, and after d5, it's actually black who gets the biggest center. And if you've noticed that black has this half-open f file, well, that's called foreshadowing, kids, because that's about to play a big role in this game. After Nakamura saved his knight, Julio did something very surprising. I think you or me would have played bishop d7 to defend the knight. It is being attacked twice. In fact, that's a totally good move. But Julio really wanted to checkmate in this game, and he castled, sacrificing a pawn to get development and to get control of that F file. So the bishop took, 
Oof. Julio took back. Oh. Nakamura took. White is up a pawn. But after the move queen e8, the queen is thinking about coming over somewhere on the king side like g6. So Nakamura got rid of the bishop pair and distracted the queen for a moment. And then he attempted to get his king safe. But there are no minor pieces guarding the white king. I'm not even going to draw any arrows because uh, I think you can see there's nothing over there but pawns. So here we go. Julio plays knight g4, putting pressure on this pawn and thinking about playing queen h4 as well. In fact, if the queen gets to h4, there will be a double attack. There'll be a checkmate and there'll be a third piece attacking f2. So Nakamura tried the no parking sign, but instead of saving the knight, he was hit with the move e3. What a fantastic move. And if the knight is captured, of course, there's a fork on e2. Black will win the exchange. So Black had to get rid of that strong e pawn after it was captured. Then knight takes. Pawn takes, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking queen takes pawn, right? No, Julio plays oh. bishop, takes h3. What an unbelievable move going after the hook pawn. And Oof. if this pawn gets captured, queen takes oh. e3, leads to a winning attack for black. I'm not gonna show you all the lines, but the white king has no protection left. So we're gonna go back. Nakamura, of course, did not take the bishop. And instead he played rook f3, defending this pawn. Now it looks like he actually wandered into a skewer after bishop g4, but now he's able to play rook takes rook to get out of it. And after rook takes, it actually almost looks like white is winning a piece. But if the queen takes this bishop, again, we have the move queen takes e3 with a very, very strong attack. There's no development for white. So Nakamura did not want to go down that road. And instead in this position, he played the move queen e1, but the attack is not over because the rook is coming up to f6. Now the rook might just come to the square e6 and just go after this pawn. Or it could slide over to one of these two squares and attack on the g or the h file. Literally, there's three different files that rook could use. Now, after the knight goes to d2, the knight can always drop back to f1 to defend this. So Julio plays the move rook to g6. And after queen to g3, we had queen to e6, queen f4, and now bishop h3. And you can see the attack is still raging. Although white tried g3 to get the pawn to safety, Julio just kept the attack going by playing the move pawn to h5. You can very clearly see this pawn wants to go to h4. And if the queen takes, then we cash in by taking on e3. And there's too many threats for white to deal with. So that was a really cool way of dealing with the Ponziani. It actually turns out that one of the world's best attackers, Akamura, got attacked with this counter gambit F5. And there you go, you don't see it often, but Fun Master Mike gave you my digital written permission to move your F pawn against the Ponziani.